The Battle of Verdun, French, Bataille de Verdun, German, Schlacht um Verdun, was fought from 21 February to December 18, 1916 on the Western Front in France. The battle was the longest of the First World War and took place on the hills north of Verdun sur Meuse. The German 5th Army attacked the defenses of the fortified region of Verdun, RFE, Région Fortifiée de Verdun, and those of the French 2nd Army on the right, east, bank of the Meuse. Using the experience of the Second Battle of Champagne in 1915, the Germans planned to capture the Meuse Heights, an excellent defensive position with good observation for artillery fire on Verdun. The Germans hoped that the French would commit their strategic reserve to recapture the position and suffer catastrophic losses at little cost to the Germans. Poor weather delayed the beginning of the attack until 21 February but the Germans captured Fort Duomont in the first three days. The advance then slowed for several days, despite inflicting many French casualties. By 6 March, 20 half-French divisions were in the RFV and a more extensive defense in depth had been constructed. Philippe Pétain ordered no retreat and that German attacks were to be counter-attacked, despite this exposing French infantry to German artillery fire. By 29 March, French guns on the west bank had begun a constant bombardment of Germans on the east bank, causing many infantry casualties. The German offensive was extended to the left, west, bank of the Meuse, to gain observation and eliminate the French artillery firing over the river but the attacks failed to reach their objectives. In early May, the Germans changed tactics again and made local attacks and counterattacks. the French recaptured part of Fort Duomont but then the Germans ejected them and took many prisoners. The Germans tried alternating their attacks on either side of the Meuse and in June captured Fort Vaux. The Germans advanced towards the last geographical objectives of the original plan, at fleury des vent duomont and Fort Souville, driving a salient into the French defenses. Fleury was captured and the Germans came within 4 kilometers, 2 miles, of the Verdun Citadel but in July the offensive was cut back to provide troops, artillery and ammunition for the Battle of the Somme, leading to a similar transfer of the French 10th Army to the Somme front. From 23 June to 17 August, Fleury changed hands 16 times and a German attack on Fort Souville failed. The offensive was reduced further but to keep French troops in the RFE, away from the Somme, ruses were used to disguise the change. In September and December, French counteroffensives recaptured much ground on the east bank and recovered Fort Duomont and Fort Vaux. The battle lasted for 302 days, the longest and one of the most costly in human history. In 2000, Hannes Herr and Klaus Naumann calculated that the French suffered 377,231 casualties and the Germans 337,000, a total of 714,231, an average of 70,000 a month. In 2014, William Philpott wrote of 976,000 casualties in 1916 and 1,250,000 in the vicinity during the war. In France, the battle came to symbolize the determination of the French army and the destructiveness of the war. Background Strategic Developments After the German invasion of France had been halted at the First Battle of the Marne in September 1914, the War of Movement ended at the Battle of the Iser and the First Battle of Ypres. The Germans built field fortifications to hold the ground captured in 1914 and the French began siege warfare to break through the German defenses and recover the lost territory. In late 1914 and in 1915, offensives on the Western Front had failed to gain much ground and been extremely costly in casualties. According to his memoirs written after the war, the chief of the German general staff, Erich von Falkenhayn, believed that although victory might no longer be achieved by a decisive battle, the French army could still be defeated if it suffered a sufficient number of casualties. Falkenhayn offered five corps from the strategic reserve for an offensive at Verdun at the beginning of February 1916 but only for an attack on the east bank of the Meuse. Falkenhayn considered it unlikely the French would be complacent about Verdun, he thought that they might send all their reserves there and begin a counter-offensive elsewhere or fight to hold Verdun while the British launched a relief offensive. After the war, Kaiser Wilhelm II and Gerhard Tappen, the operations officer at Oberste Harrisleitung, OHL, General Headquarters, wrote that Falkenhayn believed the last possibility was most likely. By seizing or threatening to capture Verdun, the Germans anticipated that the French would send all their reserves, which would then have to attack secure German defensive positions supported by a powerful artillery reserve. In the gorlis tarnuf offensive, 1st of May to September 19, 1915, the German and Austro-Hungarian armies attacked Russian defenses frontally, after pulverizing them with large amounts of heavy artillery. During the Second Battle of Champagne, Herb Schlacht Autumn Battle, of 25th of September to November 6, 1915, the French suffered extraordinary casualties from the German heavy artillery, which Falkenhayn considered offered a way out of the dilemma of material inferiority and the growing strength of the Allies. In the north, 
a British relief offensive would wear down British reserves, to no decisive effect but create the conditions for a German counter-offensive near Arras. Hints about Falkenhayn's thinking were picked up by Dutch military intelligence and passed on to the British in December. The German strategy was to create a favourable operational situation without a mass attack, which had been costly and ineffective when it had been tried by the Franco-British, by relying on the power of heavy artillery to inflict mass losses. A limited offensive at Verdun would lead to the destruction of the French strategic reserve in fruitless counter-attacks and the defeat of British reserves in a futile relief offensive, leading to the French accepting a separate peace. If the French refused to negotiate, the second phase of the strategy would begin in which the German armies would attack terminally weakened Franco-British armies, mop up the remains of the French armies and expel the British from Europe. To fulfill this strategy, Falkenhayn needed to hold back enough of the strategic reserve for the Anglo-French relief offensives and then conduct a counter-offensive, which limited the number of divisions which could be sent to the 5th Army at Verdun, for Unternechmann Gericht, Operation Judgment. The fortified region of Verdun, RFE, lay in a salient form during the German invasion of 1914. The commander-in-chief of the French army, General Joseph Joffrey, had concluded from the swift capture of the Belgian fortresses at the Battle of Liège and at the Siege of Namur in 1914 that fixed defenses had been made obsolete by German siege guns. In a directive of the General Staff of August 5, 1915, the RFE was to be stripped of 54 artillery batteries and 128,000 rounds of ammunition. Plans to demolish Forts Duomont and Vaux to deny them to the Germans were made and 5,000 kilograms, 11,000 pounds, of explosives had been laid by the time of the German offensive on 21 February. The 18 large forts and other batteries around Verdun were left with fewer than 300 guns and a small reserve of ammunition while their garrisons had been reduced to small maintenance crews. The railway line from the south into Verdun had been cut during the Battle of Fleury in 1914, with the loss of saint Miel. The line west from Verdun to Paris was cut at Aubreville in mid-July 1915 by the German Third Army, which had attacked southwards through the Argonne Forest for most of the year. Région fortifiée de Verdun For centuries, Verdun, on the Meuse River, had played an important role in the defense of the French hinterland. Attila the Hun failed to seize the town in the 5th century and when the Empire of Charlemagne was divided under the Treaty of Verdun, 843, the town became part of the Holy Roman Empire. The Peace of Westphalia of 1648 awarded Verdun to France. At the heart of the city was a citadel built by Vauban in the 17th century. A double ring of 28 forts and smaller works, ouvrages, had been built around Verdun on commanding ground, at least 150 meters, 490 feet, above the river valley, 2.5 to 8 kilometers, 1.6 to 5.0 miles, from the citadel. A program had been devised by Serre de Riviere in the 1870s to build two lines of fortresses from Belfort to Epinal and from Verdun to Toul as defensive screens and to enclose towns intended to be the bases for counterattacks. Many of the Verdun forts had been modernized and made more resistant to artillery, with a reconstruction program begun at Duomont in the 1880s. A sand cushion and thick, steel reinforced concrete tops up to 2.5 meters, 8.2 feet, thick, buried under 1 to 4 meters. 3.3 to 13.1 feet, of earth, were added. The forts and ouvrages were sited to overlook each other for mutual support and the outer ring had a circumference of 45 kilometers, 28 miles. The outer forts had 79 guns in shell-proof turrets and more than 200 light guns and machine guns to protect the ditches around the forts. Six forts had 155 mm guns and retractable turrets and 14 had retractable twin 75 mm turrets. In 1903, Duomont was equipped with a new concrete bunker, casemate de Bourges, containing two 75mm field guns to cover the southwestern approach, and the defensive works along the ridge to Ouvrage de Freuter. More guns were added from 1903 to 1913, in four retractable steel turrets. The guns could rotate for all-round defense and two smaller versions, at the northeastern and northwestern corners of the fort, house twin Hotchkiss machine guns. On the east side of the fort, an armored turret with a 155mm short-barreled gun faced north and northeast, and another house twin 75mm guns at the north end, to cover the intervals between forts. The fort at Duomont formed part of a complex of the village, fort, six ouvrages, five shelters, six concrete batteries, an underground infantry shelter, two ammunition depots and several concrete infantry trenches. The Verdun forts had a network of concrete infantry shelters, armored observation posts, batteries, concrete trenches, command posts and underground shelters between the forts. The artillery comprised circa 1,000 guns, with 250 in reserve and the forts and ouvrages were linked by telephone and telegraph, a narrow-gauge railway system and a road network, on mobilization, 
the RFE had a garrison of 66,000 men and rations for six months. Prelude. German Offensive Preparations. Verdun had been isolated on three sides since 1914 and the mainline Paris saint menehould les islets clermont and argonne auberville verdun railway in the Forest of Argonne was closed in mid-July 1915. The right flank divisions of the 5th Army, General Major Crown Prince Wilhelm, reached the La Morte Fee Hill 285 ridge after continuous local attacks, rendering the railway unusable. Only a light railway remained to carry bulk supplies, German-controlled railways lay only 24 kilometers, 15 miles, to the north of the front line. A corps was moved to the 5th Army to provide labor for the preparation of the offensive. Areas were emptied of French civilians and buildings requisitioned. Thousands of kilometers of telephone cable were laid, a huge amount of ammunition and rations was dumped under cover and hundreds of guns were emplaced and camouflaged. Ten new rail lines with 20 stations were built in vast underground shelters, Stalin, 4.5 to 14 meters, 15 to 46 feet, deep were dug, each to accommodate up to 1,200 German infantry. The 3rd Corps, 7 Reserve Corps and 18 Corps were transferred to the 5th Army, each corps being reinforced by 2,400 experienced troops and 2,000 trained recruits. V Corps was placed behind the front line, ready to advance if necessary when the assault divisions were moving up. 15 Corps, with two divisions, was in the 5th Army Reserve, ready to advance to mop up as soon as the French defense collapsed. Special arrangements were made to maintain a high rate of artillery fire during the offensive. 33 half munitions trains per day were to deliver ammunition sufficient for 2 million rounds to be fired in the first 6 days and another 2 million shells in the next 12. Five repair shops were built close to the front to reduce delays for maintenance and factories in Germany were made ready, rapidly to refurbish artillery needing more extensive repairs. A redeployment plan for the artillery was devised to move field guns and mobile heavy artillery forward, under the covering fire of mortars and the super heavy artillery. A total of 1,201 guns were massed on the Verdun front, two-thirds of which were heavy and super heavy artillery, which was obtained by stripping the modern German artillery from the rest of the Western Front and substituting it with older types and captured Russian and Belgian guns. The German artillery could fire into the Verdun salient from three directions yet remained dispersed around the edges. German plan of attack. The 5th Army divided the attack front into areas, A occupied by the 7th Reserve Corps, B by the 18th Corps, C by the 3rd Corps and D on the Wover Plain by the 15th Corps. The preliminary artillery bombardment was to begin in the morning of 12 February. At 5 p.m., the infantry in areas A to C would advance in open order, supported by grenade and flamethrower detachments. Wherever possible, the French advanced trenches were to be occupied and the second position reconnoitred for the artillery to bombard on the second day. Great emphasis was placed on limiting German infantry casualties by sending them to follow up destructive bombardments by the artillery, which was to carry the burden of the offensive in a series of large attacks with limited objectives, to maintain a relentless pressure on the French. The initial objectives were the Meuse Heights, on a line from Fraud Terre to Fort Souville and Fort Tavannes, which would provide a secure defensive position from which to repel French counterattacks. Relentless pressure was a term added by the 5th Army staff and created ambiguity about the purpose of the offensive. Falkenheim wanted land to be captured from which artillery could dominate the battlefield and the 5th Army wanted a quick capture of Verdun. The confusion caused by the ambiguity was left to the Corps headquarters to sort out. Control of the artillery was centralized by an order for the activities of the artillery and mortars, which stipulated that the Corps generals of foot artillery were responsible for local target selection, while coordination of flanking fire by neighboring corps and the fire of certain batteries, was reserved to the 5th Army headquarters. French fortifications were to be engaged by the heaviest howitzers and enfilade fire. The heavy artillery was to maintain long-range bombardment of French supply routes and assembly areas, counter-battery fire was reserved for specialist batteries firing gas shells. Cooperation between the artillery and infantry was stressed, with accuracy of the artillery being given priority over rate of fire. The opening bombardment was to build up slowly in Trommelfeuer, a rate of fire so rapid that the sound of shell explosions merged into a rumble would not begin until the last hour. As the infantry advanced, the artillery would increase the range of the bombardment to destroy the French second position. Artillery observers were to advance with the infantry and communicate with the guns by field telephones, flares and colored balloons. When the offensive began, the French were to be bombarded continuously, with harassing fire being maintained at night. French Defensive Preparations In 1915, 237 guns and 647 long tons, 657 t of ammunition in the forts of the RFE had been removed, leaving only the heavy guns and retractable turrets. The conversion of the RFE to a conventional linear defense, 
with trenches and barbed wire began but proceeded slowly, after resources were sent west from Verdun for the 2nd Battle of Champagne, 25th of September to November 6, 1915. In October 1915, building began on trench lines known as the 1st, 2nd and 3rd positions and in January 1916, an inspection by General Noel de Castelnau, Chief of Staff at French General Headquarters, GQG, reported that the new defenses were satisfactory, except for small deficiencies in three areas. The fortress garrisons had been reduced to small maintenance crews and some of the forts had been readied for demolition. The maintenance garrisons were responsible to the central military bureaucracy in Paris, and when the 30th Corps commander, Major General Paul Chrétien, attempted to inspect Fort Duomont in January 1916, he was refused entry. Duomont was the largest fort in the RFV and by February 1916, the only artillery left in the fort were the 75mm and 155mm turret guns and light guns covering the ditch. The fort was used as a barracks by 68 technicians under the command of Warren Officer Chennet, the Guardian de Battery. One of the rotating 155mm, 6.1 in, turrets was partially manned and the other was left empty. The Hotchkiss machine guns were stored in boxes and four 75mm guns in the casemates had already been removed. The drawbridge had been jammed in the down position by a German shell and had not been repaired. The coffers, wall bunkers, with Hotchkiss revolver cannons protecting the moats, were unmanned and over 5,000 kilograms, 11,023 pounds, five long tons, of explosives had been placed in the fort to demolish it. In late January 1916, French intelligence obtained an accurate assessment of German military capacity and intentions at Verdun but Joffrey considered that an attack would be a diversion, because of the lack of an obvious strategic objective. By the time of the German offensive, Joffrey expected a bigger attack elsewhere but ordered the 7th Corps to Verdun on 23rd of January, to hold the north face of the West Bank. 30 Corps held the salient east of the Meuse to the north and northeast and 2 Corps held the eastern face of the Meuse Heights, Hare had 8 half-divisions in the front line, with two half divisions in close reserve. Grouped armies du center, Act, General de Langle de Carey, had the 1 and 20 Corps with two divisions each in reserve, plus most of the 19th Division. Joffrey had 25 divisions in the French Strategic Reserve. French artillery reinforcements had brought the total at Verdun to 388 field guns and 244 heavy guns, against 1,201 German guns, two thirds of which were heavy and super heavy, including 14 in, 356 mm, and 202 mortars some being 16 in, 406 mm. Eight specialist flamethrower companies were also sent to the 5th Army. Castelnau met de Langle to carry on 25th of February, who doubted the East Bank could be held. Castelnau disagreed and ordered General Frederick George's Hare the Corps commander, to hold the right, east, bank of the Meuse at all costs. Hare sent a division from the West Bank and ordered 30 Corps to hold a line from Bras to Duomont, Vaux, and Ace. Peta took over command of the defense of the RFE at 11 p.m., with Colonel Maurice de Beriscott as Chief of Staff and Colonel Bernard Serigny as Head of Operations, only to hear that Fort Duomont had fallen. Peta ordered the remaining Verdun forts to be re-garrisoned. Four groups were established, under the command of Generals Adolphe Guillaumat, Balfourier and Denis Duckin on the right bank and Georges de Bazelaire on the left bank. A line of resistance was established on the east bank from Souville to Theomont, around Fort Duomont to Fort Vaux, Moulinville and along the ridge of the Wover. On the west bank, the line ran from Cumiers to Mordome, Coat 304 and Avocourt. A line of panic was planned in secret at the final line of defense north of Verdun, through Forts Belleville, Saint-Michel, and Moulinville. I Corps and 20 Corps arrived from 24 to 26 February, increasing the number of divisions in the RFV to 14 half. By 6 March, the arrival of the 13th, 21, 14 and 33 Corps had increased the total to 20 half divisions. Battle. First Phase. 21st February to 1st March. 21 to 26 February. Unternechman Gericht, Operation Judgment, was due to begin on 12th of February but fog, heavy rain and high winds delayed the offensive until 7.15 a.m. on 21st of February, when a 10-hour artillery bombardment by 808 guns began. The German artillery fired circa 1 million shells along a front about 30 kilometers, 19 miles, long by 5 kilometers, 3.1 miles, wide. The main concentration of fire was on the right, east, bank of the Meuse River. 26 super-heavy, long-range guns, up to 420 mm, 16.5 in, fired on the forts in the city of Verdun, a rumble could be heard 160 kilometers, 99 miles, away. The bombardment was paused at midday, 
as a ruse to prompt French survivors to reveal themselves and German artillery observation aircraft were able to fly over the battlefield unmolested by French aircraft. The 3rd Corps, 7 Corps and 18 Corps attacked at 4 p.m. The Germans used flamethrowers and stormtroopers followed closely with rifles slung, using hand grenades to kill the remaining defenders. This tactic had been developed by Captain Willy Rohr and Sturm Bataillon near 5, Rohr, the battalion which conducted the attack. French survivors engaged the attackers, yet the Germans suffered only circa 600 casualties. By 22nd of February German troops had advanced 5 kilometers, 3.1 miles, and captured Bois des Corps at the edge of the village of Flabus. Two French battalions led by Colonel Emile Drian had held the Bois, Wood, for two days but were forced back to Simonu, Beaumont and Auga and Orns. Drian was killed, fighting with the 56th and 59th battalions de chasseurs à pied and only 118 of the chasseurs managed to escape. Poor communications meant that only then did the French high command realize the seriousness of the attack. The Germans managed to take the village of Omon but French forces repulsed a German attack on the village of Bois de Lerbeboy. On 23rd of February, a French counterattack at Bois des Corps was repulsed. Fighting for Bois de Lerbeboy continued until the Germans outflanked the French defenders from Bois de Waverel. The German attackers had many casualties during their attack on Bois de Fosse and the French held on to Simonia. German attacks continued on 24th of February and the French 30 Corps was forced out of the second line of defense. 20 Corps, General Maurice Balfourier, arrived at the last minute and was rushed forward. That evening Castelnau advised Joffrey that the Second Army, under General Peta, should be sent to the RFE. The Germans had captured Beaumont and Verdunoy, Bois de Fosse and Bois de Couriers and were moving up Ravenhassel which led to Fort Duomont. At 3 p.m. on 25 February, infantry of Brandenburg Regiment 24 advanced with the two and three battalions side by side, each formed into two waves composed of two companies each. A delay in the arrival of orders to the regiments on the flanks, led to the 3rd Battalion advancing without support on that flank. The Germans rushed French positions in the woods and on Cote 347, with the support of machine gun fire from the edge of Bois Hermitage. The German infantry took many prisoners as the French on Cote 347 were outflanked and withdrew to Duomont village. The German infantry had reached their objectives in fewer than 20 minutes and pursued the French, until fired on by a machine gun in Duomont church. Some German troops took cover in woods and a ravine which led to the fort, when German artillery began to bombard the area, the gunners having refused to believe claims sent by field telephone that the German infantry were within a few hundred meters of the fort. Several German parties were forced to advance to find cover from the German shelling and two parties independently made for the fort. They did not know that the French garrison was made up of only a small maintenance crew led by a warrant officer, since most of the Verdun forts had been partly disarmed, after the demolition of Belgian forts in 1914, by the German super-heavy Krupp 420mm mortars. The German party of circa 100 soldiers tried to signal to the artillery with flares but twilight and falling snow obscured them from view. Some of the party began to cut through the wire around the fort, while French machine gun fire from Duomont village ceased. The French had seen the German flares and took the Germans on the fort to be Zouave retreating from Cote 378. The Germans were able to reach the northeast end of the fort before the French resumed firing. The German party found a way through the railings on top of the ditch and climbed down without being fired on, since the machine gun bunkers, coffers de contrescarpe, at each corner of the ditch had been left unmanned. The German parties continued and found a way inside the fort through one of the unoccupied ditch bunkers and then reached the central route around par. After quietly moving inside, the Germans heard voices and persuaded a French prisoner, captured in an observation post, to lead them to the lower floor, where they found warrant officer Chenin and about 25 French troops, most of the skeleton garrison of the fort, and took them prisoner. On 26 February, the Germans had advanced 3 kilometers, 1.9 miles, on a 10 kilometers, 6.2 miles, front, French losses were 24,000 men and German losses were circa 25,000 men. A French counterattack on Fort Duomont failed and Peta ordered that no more attempts were to be made, existing lines were to be consolidated and other forts were to be occupied, rearmed and supplied to withstand a siege if surrounded. 27 to 29 February. The German advance gained little ground on 27th of February after a thaw turned the ground into a swamp and the arrival of French reinforcements increased the effectiveness of the defense. Some German artillery became unserviceable and other batteries became stranded in the mud. German infantry began to suffer from exhaustion and unexpectedly high losses, 500 casualties being suffered in the fighting around Duomont village. On 29 February, the German advance was contained at Duomont by a heavy snowfall and the defense of French 33rd Infantry Regiment. 
Delays gave the French time to bring up 90,000 men and 23,000 short tons, 21,000 t of ammunition from the railhead at Bar le Duc de Verdun. The swift German advance had gone beyond the range of artillery covering fire and the muddy conditions made it very difficult to move the artillery forward as planned. The German advance southwards brought it into range of French artillery west of the Meuse, whose fire caused more German infantry casualties than in the earlier fighting, when French infantry on the east bank had fewer guns in support. Second phase, 6th March to 15th April. 6 to 11 March. Before the offensive, Falkenhayn had expected that French artillery on the west bank would be suppressed by counter-battery fire but this had failed. The Germans set up a specialist artillery force to counter French artillery fire from the west bank but this also failed to reduce German infantry casualties. The 5th Army asked for more troops in late February but Falkenhayn refused, due to the rapid advance already achieved on the east bank and because he needed the rest of the OHL reserve for an offensive elsewhere, once the attack at Verdun had attracted and consumed French reserves. The pause in the German advance on 27th of February led Falkenhayn to have second thoughts to decide between terminating the offensive or reinforcing it. On 29th of February, Nobelstorff, the 5th Army Chief of Staff, prized two divisions from the OHL Reserve, with the assurance that once the heights on the West Bank had been occupied, the offensive on the East Bank could be completed. The Vi Reserve Corps was reinforced with the X Reserve Corps, to capture a line from the south of Avocourt to Cote 304 north of Essens, Le Mort Ohm, Bois de Cumiers and Cote 205, from which the French artillery on the West Bank could be destroyed. The artillery of the two corps assault group on the West Bank was reinforced by 25 heavy artillery batteries, artillery command was centralized under one officer and arrangements were made for the artillery on the East Bank to fire in support. The attack was planned by General Heinrich von Gossler in two parts, on Mort Ohm and Cote 265 on 6 March, followed by attacks on Avocourt and Cote 304 on 9 March. The German bombardment reduced the top of Cote 304 from a height of 304 meters, 997 feet, to 300 meters, 980 feet. Mordeaux sheltered batteries of French field guns, which hindered German progress towards Verdun on the right bank. The hills also provided commanding views of the left bank. After storming the Bois des Corbeaux and then losing it to a French counterattack, the Germans launched another assault on Mordeaux on 9th of March, from the direction of Bethincourt to the northwest. Bois de Corbeau was captured again at great cost in casualties, before the Germans took parts of Mort Ohm, Cote 304, Cumiers and Haddoncourt on 14 March. 11 March to 9 April. After a week, the German attack had reached the first day objectives, to find that French guns behind Cote de Mari and Bois Boris were still operational and inflicting many casualties among the Germans on the east bank. German artillery moved to Cote 265, was subjected to systematic artillery fire by the French, which left the Germans needing to implement the second part of the West Bank offensive, to protect the gains of the first phase. German attacks changed from large operations on broad fronts, to narrow front attacks with limited objectives. On 14 March a German attack captured Cote 265 at the west end of Mort Ohm but the French 75th Infantry Brigade managed to hold Cote 295 at the east end. On 20 March, after a bombardment by 13,000 trench mortar rounds, the 11th Bavarian and 11th Reserve Divisions attacked Bois d'Avacourt and Bois de Malincourt and reached their initial objectives easily. Gossler ordered a pause in the attack, to consolidate the captured ground and to prepare another big bombardment for the next day. On 22nd of March, two divisions attacked Termite Hill near Cote 304 but were met by a mass of artillery fire, which also fell on assembly points and the German lines of communication, ending the German advance. The limited German success had been costly and French artillery inflicted more casualties as the German infantry tried to dig in. By 30th of March, Gossler had captured Bois de Malincourt at a cost of 20,000 casualties and the Germans were still short of Cote 304. On 30th of March, the 22nd Reserve Corps arrived as reinforcements and General Max von Galwitz took command of a new attack group west, Angriffskrupp West. Malincourt village was captured on 31st of March, Haucourt fell on 5th of April and Bethincourt on 8th of April. On the east bank, German attacks near Vaux reached Bois-Quillet and the vaux Fleury railway but were then driven back by the French 5th Division. An attack was made on a wider front along both banks by the Germans at noon on 9th of April, with five divisions on the left bank but this was repulsed except at Mordome, where the French 42nd Division was forced back from the northeast face. On the right bank an attack on Côte du Poivre failed. In March the German attacks had no advantage of surprise and faced a determined and well-supplied adversary in superior defensive positions. 
German artillery could still devastate French defensive positions but could not prevent French artillery fire from inflicting many casualties on German infantry and isolating them from their supplies. Massed artillery fire could enable German infantry to make small advances but massed French artillery fire could do the same for French infantry when they counterattacked, which often repulsed the German infantry and subjected them to constant losses, even when captured ground was held. The German effort on the West Bank also showed that capturing a vital point was not sufficient, because it would be found to be overlooked by another terrain feature, which had to be captured to ensure the defense of the original point, which made it impossible for the Germans to terminate their attacks, unless they were willing to retire to the original front line of February 1916. By the end of March the offensive had cost the Germans 81,607 casualties and Falkenhayn began to think of ending the offensive, lest it become another costly and indecisive engagement similar to the First Battle of Ypres in late 1914. The 5th Army staff requested more reinforcements from Falkenhayn on 31 March with an optimistic report claiming that the French were close to exhaustion and incapable of a big offensive. The 5th Army Command wanted to continue the East Bank offensive until a line from Ouvrage de Théomont, to Fleury, Fort Souville and Fort de Tavannes had been reached, while on the West Bank the French would be destroyed by their own counterattacks. On 4 April, Falkenhayn replied that the French had retained a considerable reserve and that German resources were limited and not sufficient to replace continuously men and munitions. If the resumed offensive on the East Bank failed to reach the Meuse Heights, Falkenhayn was willing to accept that the offensive had failed and ended. Third Phase, 16 April to 1 July. April. The failure of German attacks in early April by anger of Skrupp OST, led Nobelstorff to take soundings from the 5th Army Corps commanders, who unanimously wanted to continue. The German infantry were exposed to continuous artillery fire from the flanks and rear, communications from the rear and reserve positions were equally vulnerable, which caused a constant drain of casualties. Defensive positions were difficult to build, because existing positions were on ground which had been swept clear by German bombardments early in the offensive, leaving German infantry with very little cover. The 15th Corps commander, General Berthold von Diemling also wrote that French heavy artillery and gas bombardments were undermining the morale of the German infantry, which made it necessary to keep going to reach safer defensive positions. Nobelstorff reported these findings to Falkenhayn on 20 April, adding that if the Germans did not go forward, they must go back to the start line of 21 February. Nobelstorff rejected the policy of limited piecemeal attacks tried by Madras as commander of Angriff Skrupp OST and advocated a return to wide front attacks with unlimited objectives, swiftly to reach the line from Ouvrage de Théomont to Fleury, Fort Souville and Fort de Tavannes. Falkenhayn was persuaded to agree to the change and by the end of April, 21 divisions, most of the OHL reserve, had been sent to Verdun and troops had also been transferred from the Eastern Front. The resort to large, unlimited attacks was costly for both sides but the German advance proceeded only slowly. Rather than causing devastating French casualties by heavy artillery with the infantry in secure defensive positions, which the French were compelled to attack, the Germans inflicted casualties by attacks which provoked French counterattacks and assumed that the process inflicted five French casualties for two German losses. In mid-March, Falkenhayn had reminded the 5th Army to use tactics intended to conserve infantry, after the corps commanders had been allowed discretion to choose between the cautious, step-by-step -step tactics desired by Falkenhayn and maximum efforts, intended to obtain quick results. On the third day of the offensive, the 6th Division of the 3rd Corps, General Ewald von Lockau, had ordered that Erbeboy be taken regardless of loss and the 5th Division had attacked Waverl to the accompaniment of its band. Falkenhayn urged the 5th Army to use Stastrup and Storm units, composed of two infantry squads and one of engineers, armed with automatic weapons, hand grenades, trench mortars and flamethrowers, to advance in front of the main infantry body. The Stastruppen would conceal their advance by shrewd use of terrain and capture any blockhouses which remained after the artillery preparation. Strong points which could not be taken were to be bypassed and captured by follow-up troops. Falkenhayn ordered that the command of field and heavy artillery units was to be combined, with a commander at each corps headquarters. Common observers and communication systems would ensure that batteries in different places could bring targets under converging fire, which would be allotted systematically to support divisions. In mid-April, Falkenhayn ordered that infantry should advance close to the barrage, to exploit the neutralizing effect of the shell fire on surviving defenders, because fresh troops at Verdun had not been trained in these methods. Nobelstorff persisted with attempts to maintain momentum, which was incompatible with casualty conservation by limited attacks, with pauses to consolidate and prepare. Madra and other commanders who disagreed were sacked. Falkenhayn also intervened to change German defensive tactics, advocating a dispersed defense with the second line to be held as a main line of resistance and jumping-off point for counterattacks. 
machine guns were to be set up with overlapping fields of fire in an entry given specific areas to defend. When French infantry attacked, they were to be isolated by spare fuel, barrage fire, on their former front line, to increase French infantry casualties. The changes desired by Falkenhayn had little effect, because the main cause of German casualties was artillery fire, just as it was for the French. 4-22 May From 10 May German operations were limited to local attacks, either in reply to French counterattacks on 11th of April between Duomont and Vaux and on 17th of April between the Meuse and Duomont, or local attempts to take points of tactical value. At the beginning of May, General Peita was promoted to the command of Grouped Armies du Centre, GAC, and General Robert Nivelle took over the 2nd Army at Verdun. From 4 to 24 May, German attacks were made on the west bank around Mort Homme and on 4 May, the north slope of Cote 304 was captured. French counterattacks from 5 to 6 May were repulsed. The French defenders on the crest of Cote 304 were forced back on 7 May but German infantry were unable to occupy the ridge, because of the intensity of French artillery fire. Cumiers and Corets fell on 24 May as a French counterattack began at Fort Duomont. 22-24 May In May, General Nivelle, who had taken over the 2nd Army, ordered General Charles Mangan, commander of the 5th Division to plan a counterattack on Fort Duomont. The initial plan was for an attack on a 3 km, 1.9 miles, front but several minor German attacks captured the Foscote and Kulover ravines on the southeast and west sides of the fort. A further attack took the ridge south of the Raven to Kulover, which gave the Germans better routes for counterattacks and observation over the French lines to the south and southwest. Mangan proposed a preliminary attack to retake the area of the ravines, to obstruct the routes by which a German counterattack on the fort could be made. More divisions were necessary but these were refused to preserve the troops needed for the forthcoming offensive on the Somme. Mangan was limited to one division for the attack with one in reserve. Nivelle reduced the attack to an assault on Morchi Trench, Bonnet de Vec, Fontaine Trench, Fort Duomont, a machine gun turret and Hongroy's trench, which would require an advance of 500 meters, 550 yards, on a 1,150 meters, 1,260 yards front. Three Corps was to command the attack by the 5th Division and the 71st Brigade, with support from three balloon companies for artillery observation and a fighter group. The main effort was to be conducted by two battalions of the 129th Infantry Regiment, each with a pioneer company and a machine gun company attached. The 2nd Battalion was to attack from the south and the 1st Battalion was to move along the west side of the fort to the north end, taking Fontaine Trench and linking with the 6th Company. Two battalions of the 74th Infantry Regiment were to advance along the east and southeast sides of the fort and take a machine gun turret on a ridge to the east. Flank support was arranged with neighboring regiments and diversions were planned near Fort Vaux and the Raven de Dame. Preparations for the attack included the digging of 12 kilometers, 7.5 miles, of trenches in the building of large numbers of depots and stores but little progress was made due to a shortage of pioneers. French troops captured on 13 May, disclosed the plan to the Germans, who responded by subjecting the area to more artillery harassing fire, which also slowed French preparations. The French preliminary bombardment by four 370mm mortars and 300 heavy guns, began on 17 May and by 21 May, the French artillery commander claimed that the fort had been severely damaged. During the bombardment the German garrison in the fort experienced great strain, as French heavy shells smashed holes in the walls and concrete dust, exhaust fumes from an electricity generator and gas from disinterred corpses polluted the air. Water ran short but until 20 May, the fort remained operational, reports being passed back and reinforcements moving forward until the afternoon, when the Bourges casemate was isolated and the wireless station in the northwestern machine gun turret burnt down. Conditions for the German infantry in the vicinity were far worse and by 18 May, the French destructive bombardment had obliterated many defensive positions, the survivors sheltering in shell holes and dips of the ground. Communication with the rear was severed and food and water ran out by the time of the French attack on 22 of May. The troops of Infantry Regiment 52 in front of Fort Duomont had been reduced to 37 men near Thilmont Farm and German counter-barrages inflicted similar losses on French troops. On 22 of May, French Newport fighters attacked eight observation balloons and shot down six for the loss of one Newport 16. Other French aircraft attacked the 5th Army headquarters at Stenay. German artillery fire increased in 20 minutes before zero hour. A German bombardment began, which reduced the 129th Infantry Regiment companies to about 45 men each. The assault began at 11.50 a.m. on 22nd of May on a 1 km, 0.62 miles front. On the left flank the 36th Infantry Regiment attack quickly captured more Chi Trench and Bonnet de Vec but suffered many casualties and the regiment could advance no further. 
The flank guard on the right was pinned down, except for one company which disappeared and in Bois Quillette, a battalion of the 74th Infantry Regiment was unable to leave its trenches, the other battalion managed to reach its objectives at an ammunition depot, shelter DV-1 at the edge of Bois Quillette and the machine gun turret east of the fort, where the battalion found its flanks unsupported. Despite German small arms fire, the 129th Infantry Regiment reached the fort in a few minutes and managed to get in through the west and south sides. By nightfall, about half of the fort had been recaptured and next day, the 34th Division was sent to reinforce the French troops in the fort. The attempt to reinforce the fort failed and German reserves managed to cut off the French troops inside and force them to surrender, 1,000 French prisoners being taken. After three days, the French had suffered 5,640 casualties from the 12,000 men in the attack and the Germans suffered 4,500 casualties in Infantry Regiment 52, Grenadier Regiment 12 and Lieb Grenadier Regiment 8 of the 5th Division. 30th May to 7th June Later in May 1916, the German attacks shifted from the left bank at Mordome and Co. 304 to the right bank, south of Fort Duomont. A German attack to reach Fleury Ridge, the last French defensive line began. The attack was intended to capture Ouvrage de Théomont, Fleury, Fort Souville and Fort Vaux at the northeast extremity of the French line, which had been bombarded by circa 8,000 shells a day since the beginning of the offensive. After a final assault on 1st of June by about 10,000 German troops, the top of Fort Vaux was occupied on 2nd of June. Fighting went on underground until the garrison ran out of water, the 574 survivors surrendering on 7th of June. When news of the loss of Fort Vaux reached Verdun, the line of panic was occupied and trenches were dug on the edge of the city. On the left bank, the German advanced from the line Cote 304, Mort Ohm and Cumiers and threatened the French hold on Haddoncourt and Avocourt. Heavy rain slowed the German advance towards Fort Souville, where both sides attacked and counterattacked for the next two months. The 5th Army suffered 2,742 casualties in the vicinity of Fort Vaux from 1st to 10th of June, 381 men being killed, 2,170 wounded and 191 missing. French counterattacks on 8 and 9th of June were costly failures. 22 to 25 June. On 22nd of June, German artillery fired over 116,000 Defosgene, Green Cross, gas shells at French artillery positions, which caused over 1,600 casualties and silenced many of the French guns. Next day at 5 a.m., the Germans attacked on a 5 kilometers, 3.1 miles, front and drove a 3 by 2 kilometers, 1.9 by 1.2 miles, salient into the French defenses. The advance was unopposed until 9 a.m., when some French troops were able to fight a rearguard action. The Ouvrage, Shelter, de Thilmont and the Ouvrage de Freuterre at the south end of the plateau were captured and the villages of Fleury and chapelle saint fine were overrun. The attack came close to Fort Souville, which had been hit by circa 38,000 shells since April, bringing the Germans within 5 kilometers, 3.1 miles, of the Verdun citadel. On June 23, 1916, Nouvelle ordered, They shall not pass. Vous ni les lasers pas passer, mes camarades, you will not let them pass, my comrades. Nivelle had been concerned about declining French morale at Verdun, after his promotion to lead the 2nd Army in June 1916, manifestations of indiscipline occurred in five frontline regiments. Defalance reappeared in the French army mutinies that followed the Nivelle Offensive, April to May 1917. Chapelle saint fine was quickly recaptured by the French and the German advance was halted. The supply of water to the German infantry broke down, the salient was vulnerable to fire from three sides and the attack could not continue without more diffosgene ammunition. Chapelle saint fine became the furthest point reached by the Germans during the Verdun offensive. On 24 June the preliminary Anglo-French bombardment began on the Somme. Fleury changed hands 16 times from 23 June to 17 August and four French divisions were diverted to Verdun from the Somme. The French artillery recovered sufficiently on 24 June to cut off the German front line from the rear. By 25th of June, both sides were exhausted and Nobelsdorf suspended the attack. Fourth phase 1st July to 17th December. By the end of May French casualties at Verdun had risen to circa 185,000 and in June German losses had reached circa 200,000 men. The opening of the Battle of the Somme on 1st of July, forced the Germans to withdraw some of their artillery from Verdun, which was the first strategic success of the Anglo-French offensive. 9 to 15 July. Fort Souville dominated a crest 1 km, 0.62 miles, southeast of Fleury and was one of the original objectives of the February offensive. The capture of the fort would give the Germans control of the heights overlooking Verdun and allow the infantry to dig in on commanding ground. 
a German preparatory bombardment began on 9th of July, with an attempt to suppress French artillery with over 60,000 gas shells, which had little effect since the French had been equipped with an improved M2 gas mask. Fort Souville and its approaches were bombarded with more than 300,000 shells, including about 500 plus 360mm, 14N, shells on the fort. An attack by three German divisions began on 11th of July but German infantry bunched on the path leading to Fort Souville and came under bombardment from French artillery. The surviving troops were fired on by 60 French machine gunners, who emerged from the fort and took positions on the superstructure. 30 soldiers of Infantry Regiment 140 managed to reach the top of the fort on 12th of July, from where the Germans could see the roofs of Verdun and the spire of the cathedral. After a small French counterattack, the survivors retreated to their start lines or surrendered. On the evening of 11th of July, Crown Prince Wilhelm was ordered by Falkenhayn to go on to the defensive and on 15th of July, the French conducted a larger counterattack which gained no ground. For the rest of the month the French made only small attacks. 1st August to 17th September On 1st of August a German surprise attack advanced 800 to 900 meters, 870 to 980 yards, towards Fort Souville, which prompted French counterattacks for two weeks, which were only able to retake a small amount of the captured ground. On 18th of August, Fleury was recaptured and by September, French counterattacks had recovered much of the ground lost in July and August. On 29th of August Falkenhayn was replaced as Chief of the General Staff by Paul von Hindenburg and First Quartermaster General Erich Ludendorff. On 3rd of September, an attack on both flanks at Fleury advanced the French line several hundred meters, against which German counterattacks from 4 to 5 September failed. The French attacked again on 9, 13 and from 15 to 17 September. Losses were light except at the Tavannes Railway Tunnel, where 474 French troops died in a fire which began on 4th of September. 20th October to 2nd November. In October 1916 the French began the first offensive battle of Verdun, one air bataille offensive de Verdun, to recapture Fort du Oman, an advance of more than 2 kilometers, 1.2 miles. Seven of the 22 divisions at Verdun were replaced by mid-October and French infantry platoons were reorganized to contain sections of riflemen, grenadiers and machine gunners. In a six-day preliminary bombardment, the French artillery fired 855,264 shells, including more than half a million 75mm field gun shells, 100,155mm medium artillery shells and 373-370mm and 400mm super heavy shells, from more than 700 guns and howitzers. Two French St. Camon railway guns, 13 kilometers, 8.1 miles, to the southwest at Baillicourt, fired the 400mm, 16-in super heavy shells, each weighing one short ton, 0.91 t. The French had identified about 800 German guns on the right bank capable of supporting the 34th, 54th, 9th and 33rd Reserve Divisions, with the 10th and 5th Divisions in reserve. At least 20 of the super-heavy shells hit Fort du Oman, the 6th penetrating to the lowest level and exploding in a Pioneer Depot, starting a fire next to 7,000 hand grenades. The 38th Division, General Guyot de Salon, 133rd Division, General Fenelon F.G. Pasiga, and 74th Division, General Charles de Lardamel, attacked at 11.40 a.m. The infantry advanced 50 meters, 55 yards, behind a creeping field artillery barrage, moving at a rate of 50 meters, 55 yards, in two minutes, beyond which a heavy artillery barrage moved in 500 to 1,000 meters, 550 to 1,090 yards lifts, as the field artillery barrage came within 150 meters, 160 yards, to force the German infantry and machine gunners to stay under cover. The Germans had partly evacuated Duoman, which was recaptured on 24th of October by French Marines and Colonial Infantry. More than 6,000 prisoners and 15 guns were captured by 25th of October but an attempt on Fort Vox failed. The Houdomont quarries, Ouvrage de Théomont and Théomont Farm, Duomont Village, the northern end of Kiet Wood, Vox Pond, the eastern fringe of Bois Fumin and the Damloop Battery were captured. The heaviest French artillery bombarded Fort Vaux for the next week and on 2nd of November, the Germans evacuated the fort, after a huge explosion caused by a 220mm shell. French eavesdroppers overheard a German wireless message announcing the departure and a French infantry company entered the fort without firing a shot. On 5th of November, the French reached the front line of 24th of February and offensive operations ceased until December. 15 December 17, 1916 the second offensive battle of Verdun, 2 Yem Bataille Offensive de Verdun, was planned by Peita and Nivelle and commanded by Mangan. The 126th Division, General Paul Muto, 38th Division, General Guyot de Salon, 37th Division, General Noel Garnier du Plessis, 
and the 133rd Division, General Fenelon Pasiga, attacked with four more in reserve and 740 heavy guns in support. The attack began at 10 a.m. on 15th of December, after a six-day bombardment of 1,169,000 shells, fired from 827 guns. The final French bombardment was directed from artillery observation aircraft, falling on trenches, dugout entrances and observation posts. Five German divisions supported by 533 guns held the defensive position, which was 2,300 meters, 1.4 miles, 2.3 kilometers, deep, with 2-3 of the infantry in the battle zone, and the remaining 1-3 in reserve 10 to 16 kilometers, 6.2 to 9.9 miles back. Two of the German divisions were under strength with only circa 3,000 infantry, instead of their normal establishment of circa 7,000. The French advance was preceded by a double creeping barrage, with shrapnel fire from field artillery 64 meters, 70 yards, in front of the infantry and a high explosive barrage 140 meters, 150 yards, ahead, which moved towards a standing shrapnel bombardment along the German second line, linked to cut off the German retreat and block the advance of reinforcements. The German defense collapsed and 13,500 men of the 21,000 in the five front divisions were lost, most having been trapped while under cover and taken prisoner when the French infantry arrived. The French reached their objectives at Vakarovil and Louvimont which had been lost in February, along with Hardomont and Louvimont Côte du Poivre, despite attacking in very bad weather. German reserve battalions did not reach the front until the evening and two Eingrief divisions, which had been ordered forward the previous evening, were still 23 kilometers, 14 miles, away at noon. By the night of 16-17 of December, the French had consolidated a new line from Bezonbox to Côte du Poivre, 2 to 3 kilometers, 1.2 to 1.9 miles, beyond Duomont and 1 kilometer, 0.62 miles, north of Fort Vaux, before the German reserves and Eingrief units could counterattack. The 155mm turret at Duomont had been repaired and fired in support of the French attack. The closest German point to Verdun had been pushed 7.5 kilometers, 4.7 miles, back and all the dominating observation points had been recaptured. The French took 11,387 prisoners and 115 guns. Some German officers complained to Mangan about their lack of comfort in captivity and he replied, We do regret it, gentlemen, but then we did not expect so many of you. Lockout, the 5th Army commander and General Hans von Svail, commander of 14 Reserve Corps, were sacked on 16th of December. Aftermath. Analysis. Falkenhayn wrote in his memoir that he sent an appreciation of the strategic situation to the Kaiser in December 1915. The string in France has reached breaking point. A mass breakthrough, which in any case is beyond our means, is unnecessary. Within our reach there are objectives for the retention of which the French general staff would be compelled to throw in every man they have. If they do so the forces of France will bleed to death, Falkenhayn. The German strategy in 1916 was to inflict mass casualties on the French, a goal achieved against the Russians from 1914 to 1915, to weaken the French army to the point of collapse. The French army had to be drawn into circumstances from which it could not escape, for reasons of strategy and prestige. The Germans planned to use a large number of heavy and super-heavy guns to inflict a greater number of casualties than French artillery, which relied mostly upon the 75mm field gun. In 2007, Robert Foley wrote that Falkenhayn intended a battle of attrition from the beginning, Contrary to the views of Wolfgang Forster in 1937, Gert Krumik in 1996 and others but the loss of documents led to many interpretations of the strategy. In 1916, critics of Falkenhayn claimed that the battle demonstrated that he was indecisive and unfit for command, echoed by Forster in 1937. In 1994, Holger Afflerbach questioned the authenticity of the Christmas Memorandum, after studying the evidence that had survived in the Kriegsjeschi Klichy for Schungsinstalt de Harris. Army Military History Research Institute, files, he concluded that the memorandum had been written after the war but that it was an accurate reflection of Falkenhayn's thinking at the time. Krumik wrote that the Christmas memorandum was fabricated to justify a failed strategy and that attrition had been substituted for the capture of Verdun, only after the attack failed. Foley wrote that after the failure of the Ypres Offensive of 1914, Falkenhayn had returned to the pre-war strategic thinking of Moltke the Elder and Hans Delbruck on Ermatung strategy, attrition strategy, because the coalition fighting Germany was too powerful to be defeated decisively. Falkenhayn wanted to divide the Allies by forcing at least one of the Entente powers into a negotiated peace. An attempt at attrition lay behind the offensive in the East in 1915 but the Russians had refused to accept German peace feelers, despite the huge defeats inflicted by the Austro-Germans. With insufficient forces to break through the Western Front and overcome the reserves behind it, 
Falkenhayn tried to force the French to attack instead, by threatening a sensitive point close to the front line and chose Verdun. Huge losses were to be inflicted on the French by German artillery on the dominating heights around the city. The 5th Army would begin a big offensive but with the objectives limited to seizing the Meuse heights on the east bank for German heavy artillery to dominate the battlefield. The French army would bleed itself white in hopeless counterattacks. The British would be forced to launch a hasty relief offensive and suffer an equally costly defeat. If the French refused to negotiate, a German offensive would mop up the remnants of the Franco-British armies, breaking the Entente once and for all. In a revised instruction to the French army in January 1916, the general staff, GQG, wrote that equipment could not be fought by men. Firepower could conserve infantry but attrition prolonged the war and consumed troops preserved in earlier battles. In 1915 and early 1916, German industry quintupled the output of heavy artillery and doubled the production of super-heavy artillery. French production had also recovered since 1914 and by February 1916 the army had 3,500 heavy guns. In May Joffrey began to issue each division with two groups of 155mm guns and each corps with four groups of long-range guns. Both sides at Verdun had the means to fire huge numbers of heavy shells to suppress the opposing defenses before risking infantry in the open. At the end of May, the Germans had 1,730 heavy guns at Verdun, and the French 548, sufficient to contain the Germans but not enough for a counteroffensive. French infantry survived bombardment better because their positions were dispersed and tended to be on dominating ground, not always visible. As soon as a German attack began, the French replied with machine gun and rapid field artillery fire. On 22nd of April, the Germans suffered 1,000 casualties and in mid-April, the French fired 26,000 field artillery shells against an attack to the southeast of Fort Duomont. A few days after taking over at Verdun, Peta ordered the air commander, Commandant Charles Tricornot arose to sweep away German fighter aircraft and to provide artillery observation. German air superiority was reversed by concentrating the French fighters in escadrilles rather than distributing them piecemeal across the front, unable to concentrate against large German formations. The fighter escadrilles drove away the German Fokker Ian Deckers and the two-seater reconnaissance and artillery observation aircraft that they protected. The fighting at Verdun was less costly to both sides than the War of Movement in 1914 when the French suffered circa 850,000 casualties and the Germans circa 670,000 from August to the end of 1914. The Fifth Army had a lower rate of loss than armies on the Eastern Front in 1915 and the French had a lower average rate of loss at Verdun than the rate over three weeks during the Second Battle of Champagne, September to October 1915, which were not fought as battles of attrition. German loss rates increased relative to losses from 1 to 2.2 in early 1915 to close to 1 to 1 by the end of the battle which continued during the Nivelle Offensive in 1917. The penalty of attrition tactics was indecision, because limited objective attacks under an umbrella of massed heavy artillery fire could succeed but led to battles of unlimited duration. Peta used a Noria, rotation, system quickly to relieve French troops at Verdun, which involved most of the French army in the battle but for shorter periods than German troops. The symbolic importance of Verdun proved a rallying point and the army did not collapse. Falkenhayn was forced to conduct the offensive for much longer and commit far more infantry than intended. By the end of April, most of the German strategic reserve was at Verdun, suffering similar casualties to the French army. The Germans believed that they were inflicting losses at a rate of 5 to 2. German military intelligence thought that by 11th of March the French had suffered 100,000 casualties and Falkenhayn was confident that German artillery could easily inflict another 100,000 losses. In May, Falkenhayn estimated that French casualties had increased to 525,000 men against 250,000 German and that the French strategic reserve was down to 300,000 men. Actual French losses were circa 130,000 by 1st of May. 42 French divisions had been withdrawn and rested by the Noria system, once infantry casualties reached 50%. Of the 330 infantry battalions of the French Metropolitan Army, 259, 78%, went to Verdun, against 48 German divisions, 25% of the Wessir, Western Army. Afflerbach wrote that 85 French divisions fought at Verdun, and that from February to August, the ratio of German to French losses was 1 to 1.1, not the third of French losses assumed by Falkenhayn. By 31st of August, the 5th Army has suffered 281,000 casualties and the French 315,000. In June 1916, the French had 2,708 guns at Verdun, including 1,138 field guns. From February to December, the French and German armies fired circa 10 million shells, weighing 1,350,000 long tons, 
1,371,663 t. By May, the German offensive had been defeated by French reinforcements, difficulties of terrain and the weather. The 5th Army Infantry was stuck in tactically dangerous positions, overlooked by the French on both banks of the Meuse, instead of dug in on the Meuse Heights. French casualties were inflicted by constant infantry attacks which were far more costly in men than destroying counterattacks with artillery. The stalemate was broken by the Brusilov Offensive and the Anglo-French Relief Offensive on the Somme, which Falkeyan had expected to begin the collapse of the Anglo-French armies. Falkenhayn had begun to remove divisions from the Western Front in June to rebuild the strategic reserve but only 12 divisions could be spared. Four divisions were sent to the Somme, where three defensive positions had been built, based on the experience of the Erbschlacht. Before the battle on the Somme began, Falkenhayn thought that German preparations were better than ever and the British offensive would easily be defeated. The 6th Army, further north, had 17 half divisions and plenty of heavy artillery, ready to attack once the British had been defeated. The strength of the Anglo-French attack on the Somme surprised Falkenhayn and his staff, despite the British casualties. Artillery losses to overwhelming Anglo-French counter-battery fire and instant counter-attacks led to far more German infantry casualties than at the height of the fighting at Verdun, where the 5th Army suffered 25,989 casualties in the first 10 days, against 40,187 2nd Army casualties on the Somme. The Russians attacked again, causing more casualties in June and July. Falkenhayn was called on to justify his strategy to the Kaiser on 8 July and again advocated the minimal reinforcement of the East in favor of the decisive battle in France, the Somme offensive was the last throw of the dice for the Entente. Falkenhayn had already given up the plan for a counter-offensive by the 6th Army and sent 18 divisions to the 2nd Army and the Russian Front from Reserve and the 6th Army, only one division remaining uncommitted by the end of August. The 5th Army had been ordered to limit its attacks at Verdun in June but a final effort was made in July to capture Fort Seville. The effort failed, and on 12 July Falkenhayn ordered a strict defensive policy, permitting only small local attacks to limit the number of troops the French could transfer to the Somme. Falkenhayn had underestimated the French, for whom victory at all costs was the only way to justify the sacrifices already made. The French army never came close to collapse and triggering a premature British relief offensive. The ability of the German army to inflict disproportionate losses had also been overestimated, in part because the 5th Army commanders had tried to capture Verdun and attacked regardless of loss. Even when reconciled to the attrition strategy, they continued with Verneitung's strategy, strategy of annihilation, and the tactics of Bewegungskrieg, maneuver warfare. Failure to reach the Meuse heights left the 5th Army in poor tactical positions and reduced to inflicting casualties by infantry attacks and counterattacks. The length of the offensive made Verdun a matter of prestige for the Germans as it was for the French and Falkenhayn became dependent on a British relief offensive being destroyed to end the stalemate. When it came, the collapse in Russia and the power of the Anglo-French attack on the Somme reduced the German armies to holding their positions as best they could. On 29th of August, Falkenhayn was sacked and replaced by Hindenburg and Ludendorff, who ended the German offensive at Verdun on 2nd of September. Casualties In 2013, Paul Jankowski wrote that since the beginning of the war, French army units had produced numerical law states, etat numériques des perts, every five days for the Bureau of Personnel at GQG. The Health Service, Service de Santé, at the Ministry of War received daily counts of wounded taken in by hospitals and other services but casualty data was dispersed among regimental depots, GQG, the Registry Office, etat civil, which recorded deaths, the Service de Santé, which counted injuries and illnesses and rencendments aux familles, family liaison, which communicated with next of kin. Regimental depots were ordered to keep fiche de position, position sheets, to record losses continuously and the premier bureau of GQG began to compare the five-day etat numériques des perts with the records of hospital admissions. The new system was used to calculate losses back to August 1914, which took several months, the system had become established by February 1916. The Etat Numériques des Perts were used to calculate casualty figures published in the Journal Officiel, the French Official History and other publications. The German armies compiled Verlustlisten, loss lists, every 10 days, which were published by the Reichsarchive in the Deutsches Jahrbuch of 1924-1925. German medical units kept detailed records of medical treatment at the front and in hospital and in 1923 the Central Nachweisamt, Central Information Office published an amended edition of the lists produced during the war, incorporating medical service data not in the Verlustlisten. Monthly figures of wounded and ill servicemen that received medical treatment were published in 1934 in the Sanitätsbericht Medical Report. Using such sources for comparison is difficult, because the information recorded losses over time, rather than place. 
losses calculated for a battle could be inconsistent, as in the statistics of the military effort of the British Empire during the Great War 1914-1920-1922. In the early 1920s, Louis Marin reported to the Chamber of Deputies but could not give figures per battle, except for some by using numerical reports from the armies, which were unreliable unless reconciled with the system established in 1916. Some French data excluded those lightly wounded but some did not. In April 1917, PQG required that the Etat Numériques des Perts discriminate between lightly wounded, treated locally for 20 to 30 days and severely wounded evacuated to hospitals. Uncertainty over the criteria had not been resolved before the war ended. Verlusless and excluded lightly wounded in the Central Nashvizemt records included them. Churchill revised German statistics by adding 2% for unrecorded wounded in the world crisis, written in the 1920s and James Edmonds, the British official historian, added 30%. For the Battle of Verdun, the Sanitatesberg contained incomplete data for the Verdun area, did not define wounded and the 5th Army field reports exclude them. The Marin report and service to Sante covered different periods but included lightly wounded. Churchill used a Reichsarchive figure of 428,000 casualties and took a figure of 532,500 casualties from the Marin report, for March to June and November to December 1916 for all the Western Front. The Etat Numériques des Perts give French casualties as 348,000 to 378,000 and in 1930, Hermann Went recorded French 2nd Army and German 5th Army casualties of 362,000 and 336,831 respectively from 21 February to 20 December, not taking account of the inclusion or exclusion of lightly wounded. In 2006, McCrandall and Quirk used the Sanitatesberg to increase the Verlusslisten by circa 11%, which gave 373,882 casualties, compared to the French official history record to December 20, 1916, of 373,231 French casualties. The Sanitatesbericht, which explicitly excluded lightly wounded, compared German losses at Verdun in 1916, averaging 37.7 casualties per thousand men, with the 9th Army in Poland 1914 which had a casualty average of 48.1 per 1,000, the 11th Army in Galicia 1915 averaging 52.4 per 1,000 men, the 1st Army on the Somme 1916 average of 54.7 per 1,000 and the 2nd Army average for the Somme 1916 of 39.1 per 1,000 men. Jankowski estimated an equivalent figure for the French 2nd Army of 40.9 men per 1,000 including lightly wounded. With a circa 11% adjustment to the German figure of 37.7 per 1,000 to include lightly wounded, following the views of McCrandall and Quirk, the loss rate is similar to the estimate for French casualties. In the second edition of the World Crisis, 1938, Churchill wrote that the figure of 442,000 was for other ranks and the figure of probably 460,000 casualties included officers. Churchill gave a figure of 278,000 German casualties, 72,000 fatal and expressed dismay that French casualties had exceeded German by about 3 to 2. Churchill wrote that an eighth needed to be deducted from his figures to account for casualties on other sectors, giving 403,000 French and 244,000 German casualties. In 1980, John Turain calculated circa 750,000 French and German casualties in 299 days, Dupuis and Dupuis, 1993, 542,000 French casualties. In 2000, Hannes Herr and Klaus Naumann calculated 377,231 French and 337,000 German casualties, a monthly average of 70,000. In 2000, Holger Afflerbach used calculations made by Hermann Wen in 1931 to give German casualties at Verdun from 21 February to August 31, 1916 to give 336,000 German and 365,000 French casualties at Verdun from February to December 1916. David Mason wrote in 2000 that there had been 378,000 French and 337,000 German casualties. In 2003, Anthony Clayton quoted 330,000 German casualties, of whom 143,000 were killed or missing. The French suffered 351,000 casualties, 56,000 killed, 100,000 missing or prisoners and 195,000 wounded. Writing in 2005, Robert Doughty gave French casualties, 21st of February to December 20, 1916, as 377,231 men and casualties of 579,798 at Verdun in the Somme, 16% of the casualties at Verdun were fatal, 56% were wounded and 28% missing, many of whom were eventually presumed dead. Doughty wrote that other historians had followed Winston Churchill, 1927, 
who gave a figure of 442,000 casualties by mistakenly including all French losses on the Western Front. R. G. Grant gave a figure of 355,000 German and 400,000 French casualties in 2005. In 2005, Robert Foley used the Wendt calculations of 1931 to give German casualties at Verdun from 21 February to August 31, 1916 of 281,000, against 315,000 French. In 2014, William Philpott recorded 377,000 French casualties, of whom 162,000 had been killed. German casualties were 337,000 and noted a recent estimate of casualties at Verdun from 1914 to 1918 of 1,250,000. Morale Fighting in such a small area devastated the land, resulting in miserable conditions for troops on both sides. Rain and then the constant artillery bombardments turned the clay soil into a wasteland of mud full of debris and human remains. Shell craters filled with water and soldiers risked drowning in them. Forests were reduced to tangled piles of wood by constant artillery fire and eventually obliterated entirely. The effect of the battle was devastating, and many men broke down with shell shock. Some French soldiers tried to desert to Spain, and faced court-martial and execution. On 20th of March, French deserters disclosed details of the French defenses to the Germans, who were able to surround 2,000 men and force them to surrender. A French lieutenant wrote, Humanity is mad. It must be mad to do what it is doing. What a massacre! What scenes of horror and carnage. I cannot find words to translate my impressions. Hell cannot be so terrible. Men are mad. Diary May 23, 1916, discontent began to spread among French troops at Verdun and after the promotion of Peta from the 2nd Army on 1st of June and his replacement by Nivelle, five infantry regiments were affected by episodes of collective indiscipline. Lieutenants Henri Herduin and Pierre Millant were summarily shot on 11th of June and Nivelle published an order of the day forbidding surrender. Subsequent operations. 20 August 26, 1917. An attack on 9 kilometers, 5.6 miles, fronts on both sides of the Meuse was planned, 13 Corps and 16 Corps to attack on the left bank with two divisions each and two in reserve. Cote 304, Mort Ohm and Cote de Loire were to be captured in a 3 kilometers, 1.9 miles, advance. On the right, east, bank, 15 Corps and 32 Corps were to advance a similar distance and take Cote de Toulou. Hills 344, 326 and the Bois de Couriers. About 34 kilometers, 21 miles, of 6 meters, 6.6 yard, wide road was rebuilt and paved for the supply of ammunition, along with a branch of the 60 centimeters, 2.0 feet, light railway. The French artillery prepared the attack with 1,280 field guns, 1.520 heavy guns and howitzers and 80 super heavy guns and howitzers. The aeronautique militaire crowded 16 escadrilles of fighter aircraft into the area to escort reconnaissance aircraft and protect observation balloons. The 5th Army had spent a year improving their defenses at Verdun, including the excavation of tunnels linking Mordome with the rear for supplies to be delivered and infantry to move with impunity. On the right bank, the Germans had developed four defensive positions, the last on the French front line of early 1916. Strategic surprise was impossible. The Germans had 380 artillery batteries in the area, bombarded frequently French positions with the new mustard gas and made several spoiling attacks to disrupt French preparations. The French counterattacked but Fayol eventually limited repost to important ground only, the rest to be retaken during the main attack. A preliminary bombardment began on 11th of August and the destructive bombardment began two days later but poor weather led to the infantry attack being put back to 20th of August. The assembly of the 25th, 16th, Division Marocan and 31st Divisions was obstructed by German gas bombardments but their attack captured all but Hill 304, which fell on 24th of August. On the right bank, 15 Corps had to cross the 3 kilometers, 1.9 miles wide Côte de Toulouse in the middle of no man's land. The French infantry reached their objectives except for a trench between Hills 344, 326 and Simonia, which was taken on 23rd of August. 32 Corps reached its objectives in a costly advance but the troops found themselves too close to German trenches and under guns on high ground between Bezonvox and Orns. The French took 11,000 prisoners for the loss of 14,000 men, 4,470 killed or missing. 7-8 September Dillamat was ordered to plan an operation to capture several trenches and a more ambitious offensive on the east bank to take the last ground from which German artillery observers could see Verdun. Petak questioned Gilamat and Fayol who criticized the selection of objectives on the right bank and argued that the French must go on or go back. The Germans counterattacked from higher ground several times in September, 
Holding the ground captured in August proved more costly than taking it. Fiol advocated a limited advance to make German counterattacks harder, improve conditions in the front line and deceive the Germans about French intentions. A 15 Corps attack on 7th of September failed, and on 8th of September 32 Corps gained a costly success. The attack continued and the trenches necessary for a secure defensive position were taken but not the last German observation point. More attacks were met by massed artillery fire and counterattacks and the French end of the operation. On 25th of November after a five-hour hurricane bombardment, the 128th and 37th Divisions, supported by 18 field artillery, 24 heavy and 9 trench artillery groups conducted a raid on a 4 kilometers, 2.5 miles, front in appalling weather. A line of pillboxes were demolished and the infantry returned to their positions. News Argonne Offensive The French 4th Army and the American 1st Army attacked on a front from Moran Villiers to the Meuse on September 26, 1918 at 5.30 a.m., after a three-hour bombardment. American troops quickly captured Malincourt, Bethincourt and forges on the left bank of the Meuse and by midday the Americans had reached Gercourt, Kiwasi, the southern part of Mafukon and Chepi. German troops were able to repulse American attacks on Mafukon Ridge, until it was outflanked to the south and Mafukon was surrounded. German counterattacks from 27 to 28 September slowed the American advance but Ivoire and Epinanti were captured, then Mafukon Ridge with 8,000 prisoners and 100 guns. On the right bank of the Meuse, a combined Franco-American force under American command, took Brabant, Omon, Bois du Mon and Bois des Corps, and then crossed the front line of February 1916. By November, circa 20,000 prisoners, circa 150 guns, circa 1,000 trench mortars and several thousand machine guns had been captured. A German retreat began and continued until the armistice. Commemoration Verdun has become for the French the representative memory of World War I, comparable to how the Battle of the Somme is viewed in the United Kingdom and Canada. Antoine Prost wrote, like Auschwitz, Verdun marks a transgression of the limits of the human condition. From 1918 to 1939, the French expressed two memories of the battle. One was a patriotic view embodied in memorials built on the battlefield and the Nouvelle Play shall not pass. The other was the memory of the survivors who recalled the death, suffering and sacrifice of others. Verdun soon became a focal point for commemorations of the war. In 1920, a ceremony was held in the citadel of Verdun to choose a body to bury in the tomb of the unknown soldier at the Arc de Triomphe. Six destroyed villages in the area were not rebuilt, but were given special status as uninhabited communes of Beaumont and Verdunois, Bezonvox, Cumiers le Mort Homme, Fleury des Vents du Aumont, Aumon Pre Simonu, and Louvimont Cote du Poivre. Alain Donizo included period photographs that show overlapping shell craters in an area of about 100 square kilometers, 39 square miles. Forests planted in the 1930s have grown up and hide most of the Zone Rouge, Red Zone, but the battlefield remains a vast graveyard, containing the mortal remains of over 100,000 missing soldiers, unless discovered by the French Forestry Service and laid in the Duomont Ossuary. The Verdun Memorial opened in 1967 and is located near Fleury des Vent Duomont. It commemorates both the French and German losses and includes a museum. In the 1960s, Verdun became a symbol of Franco German reconciliation through remembrance of common suffering and in the 1980s it became a capital of peace. Organizations were formed and old museums were dedicated to the ideals of peace and human rights. On September 22, 1984, the German Chancellor Helmut Kohl, whose father had fought near Verdun, and French President François Mitterrand, who had been taken prisoner nearby in World War II, stood at the Duomont Cemetery, holding hands for several minutes in driving rain as a gesture of Franco-German reconciliation.